traditionally, if you look at it from the Anglo-Saxon perspective, they looked upon the Nordic models as something really very different from what they think would function. Traditionally, they see Nordic countries as being welfare states uh, run by social democrats. They don't think that would work. But then things have been changing because if you look now at the various rankings on competitiveness, the Nordic countries repeatedly scores high. So now we have seen a change in that perspective. They think there's something of interest here. And that's why The Economist first came here to study that and then later the BBC because I think now they see new qualities of this. Norwegians are the richest people in the world, despite rather than because of their oil windfall. It's thanks to a radical and forward-thinking decision made by the nation's politicians. In the early years of oil, Norway's leaders understood that a sudden massive windfall like that can be a curse as well as a blessing. That it can have the effect of so overinflating the value of the national currency as to make every other sector of the productive economy uncompetitive. To put everyone except the oil people out of business. So to avoid that, Norway's political parties entered a kind of self-denying pact with each other. They agreed that none of those oil revenues should be spent in Norway itself. Instead, they'd be put into a fund to be invested overseas. Further, 96% of the interest on that fund would be reinvested overseas. All the Norwegian government allows itself is 4%, not of the capital, but of the interest on that capital. And even that tiny proportion is enough to give them some of the best schools and hospitals and public services in the world. It's called the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, or more colloquially, the State Pension Fund. It's currently worth 400 billion pounds, and it owns nearly 2% of the entire world's stocks and shares. It's owned by the people, managed by the state, and invested for the future. It's the envy of pro-independence campaigners in Scotland. There used to be a steel plant here, now it's the BI Business School, a prestigious private university near central Oslo. And this is a recruitment fair for graduating students. The school is producing the next generation of Norway's business leaders. Central Bank? Yeah. They are the people with the, with the, with the fund, they clear? NBIM, that is the petroleum fund. Right. This fund owns a proportion of most companies in the world. Uh, almost every company owns the stock exchange uh, stock list. So this is the big sovereign wealth fund Absolutely. that Norway is so famous for. Fund. And they're recruiting young people to come and manage it. For to them. work for them. Yeah. And it's managed by the central bank, but then it's split out as a separate institution called the uh, Norway Norwegian Bank Investment Management, NBIM. And that's the largest sovereignty fund in the world right now. And just to be clear, none of that money is invested in Norway itself. They, they can't do that. Like, by the constitution says none of that money should be invested in Norway. The interesting thing about the BBC uh, documentary, which is a long documentary where they visit the, all the three Nordic countries, was that in a way they placed BI, Norwegian School of Business, in the center of this. They used that as illustration for the knowledge economy. And I told the story about Nidalen, uh, how this used to be the, the, the traditional old-fashioned manufacturing. It all disappeared, like in the UK, but something uh, other came back. So now this is, and, and to them, this was a center for the knowledge economy, entrepreneurship. They were here during career day when students were interviewing with all these companies, and they saw international students interviewing. They had international students interviewing with the Norwegian pension fund abroad. And to them, this was a puzzle. I mean, this is where you want to live uh, if you want to be part of this modern economy. And this, this in a way, portrays uh, modernity, entrepreneurship, innovation. And those are the kind of qualities we need because every nation and region compete in order to attract good people, good companies. And I think this is very important to, because you need to change the image of Norway as being a place for fish and, and fjords. I mean, nobody comes here for fish and fjords except for tourism. You need to come here for business. And this is a way to place put Norway and the Nordic region back as a good place for business, international business to be located. The Economist is a very important channel because it tells so that the world that has almost no understanding of the Nordic countries that there's something of interest here. And that was why the BBC some months later came here to see, to dig a little deeper on this because they said, why could it be? And they took uh, the, the offshore oil industry as a case. They said, why is Scotland 
and Norway is so different. We had the same North Sea to develop. Norway still is a very powerful offshore technology nation. Scotland is not. So you must have been doing things differently. And this was a big puzzle for them. And that's why they came to the Nordic region. They said, maybe when we talk in Scotland, maybe we shouldn't look so much to London. We should look to the Nordic. And that's why the, this, this Viking idea is coming back in new wrapping. They tried to do something similar because in the old industrial environment, industrial economy, it, it wasn't so important because you had large bureaucracies that ran factories. Now in the, in the modern knowledge world, you need flat structures, highly educated people, highly innovative people, and that works in, in, in these type of contexts. It, and it's, there are a few other countries like the Nordic that has some, some of the same. If you look at the rankings, the Netherlands will score close with us, sometimes Switzerland will score close with us, but we outperformed the large economy, which is interesting. Music